This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, October 19, 1906, Chapters from My Autobiography, Chapter 4, by Mark Twain. When Susy was thirteen, and was a slender little maid with plaited tails of copper-tinged brown hair down her back, and was perhaps the busiest bee in the household hive, by reason of the manifold studies, health exercises, and recreations she had to attend to, she secretly, and of her own motion, and out of love, added another task to her labors, the writing of a biography of me. She did this work in her bedroom at night, and kept her record hidden. After a little the mother discovered it, and filched it, and let me see it then told Susie what she had done, and how pleased I was, and how proud. I remember that time with a deep pleasure. I had had compliments before, but none that touched me like this, none that could approach it for value in my eyes. It has kept that place always since. I have had no compliment, no praise, no tribute from any source that was so precious to me as this one was, and still is. As I read it now, after all these many years, it is still a king's message to me, and brings me the same dear surprise it brought me then, with the pathos added of the thought that the eager and hasty hand that sketched it and scrawled it will not touch mine again, and I feel as the humble and unexpectant must feel when their eyes fall upon the edict that raises them to the ranks of the noble. Yesterday, while I was rummaging in a pile of ancient notebooks of mine which I had not seen for years, I came across a reference to that biography. It is quite evident that several times, at breakfast and dinner, in those long past days, I was posing for the biography. In fact, I clearly remember that I was doing that, and I also remember that Susie detected it. I remember saying a very smart thing, with a good deal of an air, at the breakfast-table one morning, and that Susie observed to her mother privately, a little later, that Papa was doing that for the biography. I cannot bring myself to change any line or word in Susie's sketch of me, but will introduce passages from it now and then, just as they came in their quaint simplicity out of her honest heart, which was the beautiful heart of a child. What comes from that source has a charm and grace of its own, which may transgress all the recognized laws of literature, if it choose, and yet be literature still, and worthy of hospitality. I shall print the whole of this little biography before I have done with it, every word, every sentence. The spelling is frequently desperate, but it was Susie's, and it shall stand. I love it, and cannot profane it. To me it is gold. To correct it would alloy it, and not refine it. It would spoil it. It would take from it its freedom and flexibility, and make it stiff and formal. Even when it is most extravagant, I am not shocked. It is Susie's spelling, and she was doing the best she could, and nothing could better it for me. Susie began the biography in 1885, when I was in the fiftieth year of my age, and she just entering the fourteenth of hers. She begins in this way. We are a very happy family. We consist of Papa, Mama, Jean, Clara, and me. It is Papa I am writing about, and I shall have no trouble in not knowing what to say about him, as he is a very striking character. But wait a minute, I will return to Susie presently. In the matter of slavish imitation, man is the monkey's superior all the time. The average man is destitute of independence of opinion. He is not interested in contriving an opinion of his own, by study and reflection, but is only anxious to find out what his neighbor's opinion is, and slavishly adopt it. A generation ago I found out that the latest review of a book was pretty sure to be just a reflection of the earliest review of it, that whatever the first reviewer found to praise or censure in the book would be repeated in the latest reviewer's report, with nothing fresh added. Therefore, more than once, I took the precaution of sending my book in manuscript to Mr. Howells, when he was editor of the Atlantic Monthly, so that he could prepare a review of it at leisure. I knew he would say the truth about the book, 
I also knew that he would find more merit than demerit in it, because I already knew that that was the condition of the book. I allowed no copy of it to go out of the press until after Mr. Howell's notice of it had appeared. That book was always safe. There wasn't a man behind a pen in all America that had the courage to find anything in the book which Mr. Howells had not found. There wasn't a man behind a pen in America that had spirit enough to say a brave and original thing about the book on his own responsibility. I believe that the trade of critic, in literature, music, and the drama, is the most degraded of all trades, and that it has no real value, certainly no large value. When Charles Dudley Warner and I were about to bring out The Gilded Age, the editor of the Daily Graphic persuaded me to let him have an advance copy, he giving me his word of honor that no notice of it would appear in his paper until after the Atlantic Monthly Notice should have appeared. This reptile published a review of the book within three days afterward. I could not really complain, because he had only given me his word of honor as security. I ought to have required of him something substantial. I believe his notice did not deal mainly with the merit of the book, or the lack of it, but with my moral attitude toward the public. It was charged that I had used my reputation to play a swindle upon the public, that Mr. Warner had written as much as half of the book, and that I had used my name to float it, and give it currency, a currency, so the critic averred, which it could not have acquired without my name, and that this conduct of mine was a grave fraud upon the people. The graphic was not an authority upon any subject whatever. It had a sort of distinction in that it was the first and only illustrated daily newspaper that the world had seen, but it was without character. It was poorly and cheaply edited. Its opinions of a book, or of any other work of art, was of no consequence. Everybody knew this, yet all the critics in America, one after the other, copied the graphic's criticism, merely changing the phraseology, and left me under that charge of dishonest conduct. Even the great Chicago Tribune, the most important journal in the Middle West, was not able to invent anything fresh but adopted the view of the humble daily graphic, dishonesty charge, and all. However, let it go. It is the will of God that we must have critics, and missionaries, and congressmen, and humorists, and we must bear the burden. Meantime, I seem to have been drifting into criticism myself, but that is nothing. At the worst, criticism is nothing more than a crime, and I am not unused to that. What I have been travelling towards all this time is this. The first critic that ever had occasion to describe my personal appearance littered his description with foolish and inexcusable errors, whose aggregate furnished the result that I was distinctly and distressingly unhandsome. That description floated around the country in the papers, and was in constant use and wear for a quarter of a century. It seems strange to me that apparently no critic in the country could be found who could look at me, and have the courage to take up his pen and destroy that lie. That lie began its course on the Pacific coast in 1864, and it likened me in personal appearance to Petroleum V. Nasby, who had been out there lecturing. For twenty-five years afterward no critic could furnish a description of me without fetching in Nasby to help out my portrait. I knew Nasby well, and he was a good fellow, but in my life I have not felt maligned enough about any more than three persons to charge those persons with resembling Nasby. It hurts me to the heart. I was always handsome. Anybody but a critic could have seen it. It had long been a distress to my family, including Susie, that the critics could go on making this wearisome mistake year after year when there was no foundation for it. Even when a critic wanted to be particularly friendly and complimentary to me, he didn't dare to go beyond my clothes. He never ventured beyond that old, safe frontier. When he had finished with my clothes, he had said all the kind things, the pleasant things, the complimentary things he could risk. Then he dropped back on Nasby. Yesterday I found this clipping in the pocket of one of those ancient memorandum books of mine, it is of the date of thirty-nine years ago, and both the paper and the ink are yellow with the bitterness that I felt in that old day when I clipped it out to preserve it, and brood over it, and grieve about it. I will copy it here to wit. 
A correspondent of the Philadelphia Press, writing of one of Schuyler Colfax's receptions, says of our Washington correspondent, Mark Twain, the delicate humorist, was present. Quite a lion, as he deserves to be, Mark is a bachelor, faultless in taste, whose snowy vest is suggestive of endless quarrels with Washington washerwomen. But the heroism of Mark is settled for all time, for such purity and smoothness was never seen before. His lavender gloves might have been stolen from some Turkish harem, so delicate were they in size, but more likely anything else were more likely than that. In form and feature he bears some resemblance to the immortal Nasby, but whilst petroleum is brunette to the core, Twain is golden, amber-hued, melting, blonde. Let us return to Susie's biography now, and get the opinion of one who is unbiased. From Susie's Biography Papa's appearance has been described many times, but very incorrectly. He has beautiful gray hair, not any too thick or any too long, but just right. A Roman nose, which greatly improves the beauty of his features. Kind blue eyes and a small mustache. He has a wonderfully shaped head and profile. He has a very good figure. In short, he is an extraordinarily fine-looking man. All his features are perfect, except that he hasn't extraordinary teeth. His complexion is very fair, and he doesn't wear a beard. He is a very good man, and a very funny one. He has got a temper, but we all of us have in this family. He is the loveliest man I ever saw, or ever hoped to see, and, oh, so absent-minded. He does tell perfectly delightful stories. Clara and I used to sit on each arm of his chair and listen while he told us stories about the pictures on the wall. I remember the story-telling days vividly. They were a difficult and exacting audience, those little creatures. Along one side of the library in the Hartford home the bookshelves joined the mantelpiece. In fact, there were shelves on both sides of the mantelpiece. On these shelves, and on the mantelpiece, stood various ornaments. At one end of the procession was a framed oil painting of a cat's head. At the other end was a head of a beautiful young girl, life-size, called Emmeline because she looked just about like that, an impressionist watercolor. Between the one picture and the other there were twelve or fifteen of the bric-a-brac things already mentioned, also an oil painting by Elihu Vader, the young Medusa. Every now and then the children required me to construct a romance, always impromptu, not a moment's preparation permitted, and into that romance I had to get all that bric-a-brac and the three pictures. I had to start always with the cat and finish with Emmeline. I was never allowed the refreshment of a change end for end. It was not permissible to introduce a bric-a-brac ornament into the story out of its place in the procession. These bric-a-bracs were never allowed a peaceful day, a reposeful day, a restful Sabbath. In their lives there was no Sabbath, in their lives there was no peace. They knew no existence but a monotonous career of violence and bloodshed. In the course of time the bric-a-brac and the pictures showed where. It was because they had had so many and such tumultuous adventures in their romantic careers. As romancer to the children I had a hard time, even from the beginning. If they brought me a picture in a magazine and required me to build a story to it, they would cover the rest of the page with their pudgy hands to keep me from stealing an idea from it. The stories had to come hot from the bat, always. They had to be absolutely original and fresh. Sometimes the children furnished me simply a character or two, or a dozen, and required me to start out at once on that slim basis and deliver those characters up to a vigorous and entertaining life of crime. If they heard of a new trade, or an unfamiliar animal, or anything like that, I was pretty sure to have to deal with those things in the next romance. Once Clara required me to build a sudden tale out of a plumber and a bogunstrictor, and I had to do it. She didn't know what a boa constrictor was until he developed in the tale. Then she was better satisfied with it than ever. From Susie's Biography Papa's favorite game is billiards, and when he is tired and wishes to rest himself, he stays up all night and plays billiards. It seems to rest his head. He smokes a great deal almost incessantly. He has the mind of an author exactly. Some of the simplest things he can't understand. Our burglar alarm is often out of order, and Papa had been obliged to take the mahogany room off from the alarm altogether for a time,
because the burglar alarm had been in the habit of ringing even when the mahogany room was closed. At length he thought that perhaps the burglar alarm might be in order, and he decided to try and see. Accordingly he put it on, and then went down and opened the window. Consequently the alarm bell rang. It would, even if the alarm had been in order. Papa went despairingly upstairs and said to Mama, Livy, the mahogany room won't go on. I have just opened the window to see. Why, youth, Mama replied, if you've opened the window, why, of course the alarm will ring. That's what I've opened it for. Why, I just went down to see if it would ring. Mama tried to explain to Papa that when he wanted to go and see whether the alarm would ring while the window was closed, he mustn't go and open the window. But in vain Papa couldn't understand, and got very impatient with Mama for trying to make him believe an impossible thing true. This is a frank biography, and an honest one. She uses no sandpaper on me. I have to this day the same dull head in the matter of conundrums and perplexities which Susie had discovered in those long-gone days. Complexities annoy me. They irritate me. Then this progressive feeling presently warms into anger. I cannot get far in the reading of the commonest and simplest contract, with its parties of the first part, and parties of the second part, and parties of the third part, before my temper is all gone. Ashcroft comes up here every day and pathetically tries to make me understand the points of the lawsuit which we are conducting against Henry Butters, Harold Wheeler, and the rest of those plasmon buccaneers, but daily he has to give it up. It is pitiful to see, when he bends his earnest and appealing eyes upon me and says after one of his efforts, Now you do understand that, don't you? I am always obliged to say, I don't, Ashcroft. I wish I could understand it, but I don't. Send for the cat. In the days which Susie is talking about, a perplexity fell to my lot one day. F. G. Whitmore was my business agent, and he brought me out from town in his buggy. We drove by the Porte Cochet and towards the stable. Now this was a single road, and was like a spoon whose handle stretched from the gate to a great round flower bed in the neighborhood of the stable. At the approach to the flower bed, the road divided and circumnavigated it, making a loop, which I have likened to the bowl of the spoon. As we neared the loop, I saw that Whitmore was laying his course to port. I was sitting on the starboard side, the side the house was on and was going to start around that spoon-bowl on that left-hand side. I said, "'Don't do that, Whitmore. Take the right-hand side. Then I shall be next to the house when we get to the door.' He said, "'That will not happen in any case. It doesn't make any difference which way I go around this flower-bed.' I explained to him that he was an ass, but he stuck to his proposition, and I said, "'Go on and try it and see.' He went on and tried it, and sure enough he fetched me up at the door on the very side that he had said I would be. I was not able to believe it then, and I don't believe it yet. I said, Whitmore, that is merely an accident. You can't do it again. He said he could, and he drove down into the street, fetched round, came back, and actually did it again. I was stupefied, paralyzed, petrified, with these strange results. But they did not convince me. I didn't believe he could do it another time, but he did. He said he could do it all day, and fetch up the same way every time. By that time my temper was gone, and I asked him to go home and apply to the asylum, and I would pay the expenses. I didn't want to see him any more for a week. I went upstairs in a rage, and started to tell Livy about it, expecting to get her sympathy for me, and to breed aversion in her for Whitmore. But she merely burst into peal after peal of laughter as the tale of my adventure went on, for her head was like Susie's. Riddles and complexities had no terrors for it. Her mind and Susie's were analytical. I have tried to make it appear that mine was different. Many and many a time I have told that buggy experiment, hoping against hope that I would some time or other find somebody who would be on my side, but it has never happened and I am never able to go glibly forward and state the circumstances of that buggy's progress without having to halt and consider and call up in my mind the spoon-handle, the bowl of the spoon, the buggy and the horse, and my position in the buggy, and the minute I have got that far and try to turn it to the left it goes to ruin. I can't see how it is ever going to fetch me out right when we get to the door. Susie is right in her estimate. I can't understand things." 
That burglar alarm which Susie mentions led a gay and careless life, and had no principles. It was generally out of order at one point or another, and there was plenty of opportunity, because all the windows and doors in the house, from the cellar up to the top floor, were connected with it. However, in its season of being out of order, it could trouble us for only a very little while. We quickly found out that it was fooling us, and that it was buzzing its blood-curdling alarm merely for its own amusement. Then we would shut it off and send it to New York for the electrician, there not being one in all Hartford in those days. When the repairs were finished, we would set the alarm again and re-establish our confidence in it. It never did any real business except upon one single occasion. All the rest of its expensive career was frivolous and without purpose. Just that one time it performed its duty, and its whole duty, gravely, seriously, admirably. It let fly about two o'clock one black and dreary March morning, and I turned out promptly, because I knew that it was not fooling, this time. The bathroom door was on my side of the bed. I stepped in there, turned up the gas, looked at the annunciator, and turned off the alarm, so far as the door indicated was concerned, thus stopping the racket. Then I came back to bed. Mrs. Clemens opened the debate. What was it? It was the cellar door. Was it a burglar, do you think? Yes, I said, of course it was. Did you suppose it was a Sunday school superintendent? No. What do you suppose he wants? I suppose he wants jewelry, but he is not acquainted with the house, and he thinks it is in the cellar. I don't like to disappoint a burglar who I am not acquainted with, and who has done me no harm, but if he had had common sagacity enough to inquire, I could have told him we kept nothing down there but coal and vegetables. Still it may be that he is acquainted with the place, and that— what he really wants is coal and vegetables. On the whole, I think it is vegetables he is after. Are you going down to see? No, I could not be of any assistance. Let him select for himself. I don't know where the things are. Then she said, But suppose he comes up to the ground floor. That's all right. We shall know it the minute he opens a door on that floor. It will set off the alarm. Just then the terrific buzzing broke out again. I said, he has arrived. I told you he would. I know all about burglars and their ways. They are systematic people. I went into the bathroom to see if I was right, and I was. I shut off the dining-room and stopped the buzzing, and came back to bed. My wife said, What do you suppose he is after now? I said, I think he has got all the vegetables he wants, and is coming up for napkin-rings and odds and ends for the wife and children. They all have families, burglars have, and they are always thoughtful of them, always take a few necessaries of life for themselves, and fill out with tokens of remembrance for the family. In taking them they do not forget us. Those very things represent tokens of his remembrance of us, and also of our remembrance of him. We never get them again. The memory of the attention remains embalmed in our hearts. Are you going down to see what it is he wants now? No, I said. I am no more interested than I was before. They are experienced people, burglars. They know what they want. I should be no help to him. I think he is after ceramics and bric-a-brac and such things. If he knows the house, he knows that that is all that he can find on the dining-room floor." She said with a strong interest perceptible in her tone, "'Suppose he comes up here?' I said, "'It is all right. He will give us notice. What shall we do, then?' climb out the window. She said a little restively, Well, what is the use of a burglar alarm for us? Well, you have seen, dear heart, that it has been useful up to the present moment, and I have explained to you how it will be continuously useful after he gets up here. That was the end of it. He didn't ring any more alarms. Presently I said, He is disappointed, I think. He has gone off with the vegetables and the bric-a-brac, and I think he is dissatisfied. We went to sleep, and at a quarter before eight in the morning I was out and hurrying, for I was to take the 829 train for New York. I found the gas burning brightly, full head, all over the first floor. My new overcoat was gone, my old umbrella was gone, my new patent leather shoes, which I had never worn, were gone. The large window which opened into the ombra at the rear of the house was standing wide. I passed out through it, and tracked the burglar down the hill through the trees, tracked him without difficulty, because he had blazed his progress with imitation silver napkin rings and my umbrella and various other things which he had disapproved of. And I went back in triumph, and proved to my wife that he was a disappointed burglar. I had suspected he would be from the start, 
and from his not coming up to our floor to get human beings. Things happened to me that day in New York. I will tell about them another time. From Susie's Biography Papa has a peculiar gait we like. It seems just to suit him, but most people do not. He always walks up and down the room while thinking, and between each course at meals. A lady distantly related to us came to visit us once in those days. She came to stay a week. But all our efforts to make her happy failed. We could not imagine why. And she got up her anchor and sailed the next morning. We did much guessing, but could not solve the mystery. Later we found out what the trouble was. It was my tramping up and down between the courses. She conceived the idea that I could not stand her society. That word, youth, as the reader has perhaps already guessed, was my wife's pet name for me. It was gently satirical, but also affectionate. I had certain mental and material peculiarities and customs proper to a much younger person than I was. From Susie's Biography Papa is very fond of animals, particularly of cats. We had a dear little gray kitten once that he named Lazy. Papa always wears gray to match his hair and eyes. And he would carry him around on his shoulder. It was a mighty pretty sight. The gray cat sound asleep against Papa's gray coat and hair. The names that he has given our different cats are really remarkably funny. They are namely Stray Kit, Abner, Motley, Fraulein, Lazy, Buffalo Bill, Cleveland, Sour Mash, and Pestilence and Famine. At one time when the children were small we had a very black mother-cat named Satan, and Satan had a small black offspring named Sin. Pronouns were a difficulty for the children. Little Clara came in one day, her black eyes snapping with indignation, and said, Papa, Satan ought to be punished. She is out there at the greenhouse, and there she stays and stays, and his kitten is downstairs crying. From Susie's Biography Papa uses very strong language, but I have an idea not nearly so strong as when he first married Mama. A lady acquaintance of his is rather apt to interrupt what one is saying, and Papa told Mama that he thought he should say to the lady's husband, I am glad your wife wasn't present when the deity said, Let there be light. It is as I have said before. This is a frank historian. She doesn't cover up one's deficiencies, but gives them an equal showing with one's handsomer qualities. Of course I made the remark which she has quoted, and even at this distant day I am still as much as half persuaded that if that lady had been present when the Creator said, Let there be light, she would have interrupted him, and we shouldn't ever have got it. From Susie's Biography Papa said the other day, I am a mugwump, and a mugwump is pure from the marrow out. Papa knows I am writing this biography of him, and he said this for it. He doesn't like to go to church at all. Why, I never understood, until just now. He told us the other day that he couldn't bear to hear anyone talk but himself, but that he could listen to himself talk for hours without getting tired. Of course he said this in joke, but I've no doubt it was founded on truth. Mark Twain, to be continued. End of chapter 4